call upon stage Dr. Tarakeshwari, who will aim to review the benefits of early evaluation of pregnancy and how to invert the pyramid of antenatal care. Dr. Tas complicating pregnancy and recurrent pregnancy loss. I welcome you to the dais, ma'am. Thank you. A warm good afternoon and greetings from the Fernandez family. I am delighted and thankful for the topic given by Dr. Kamini Rao and the team, which this work of preconceptional evaluation has been doing for the past uh, 10 years. When we look at this, what do we mean by extended inverted pyramid for risk modulation and role of preconceptional evaluation? My talk would be going on this lines, the traditional prenatal care and then the inverted pyramid of care, now extended inverted pyramid of care with few case scenarios. This is the traditional prenatal care which was actually uh, given in the Ministry of Health in 1929 in UK where it was believed that most of the maternal and the fetal complications happen in the third trimester. So there is no role for an early pregnancy evaluation. People come around 16, 20 weeks, and then they come around 32 weeks, and then weekly till delivery, hopeful to find out some complications which happen around that time. Thanks to Professor Kipras everything has turned into the inverted pyramid of care because of his hard work and also for teaching all of us across the world. The first trimester screening has come into place to look at the chromosomal abnormalities and then further moved into the fetal therapy which you can do around that time and further to know about the complications which can happen in the early first trimester. So if you look at the first trimester screening, most of you must be doing this, the nuchal translucency, the nasal bone, apart from taking the maternal risk factors into consideration, and then you look at the uterine artery Doppler, the mean arterial pressures, and then the biochemical screening, which has revolutionized the entire first trimester screening. You have the beta HCG pap -A and the, for the past, uh, uh, I think six months we are also using the PLGF and then you give a risk assessment not only for the chromosomal the tri uh, tri trisomies but also the risk of preeclampsia can be calculated and then you give the co uh, option to the woman and then explain to her taking 150 milligram of aspirin based on the ASPRI trial which has come out in the year 2017 and then counsel her and also take her through the intense maternal monitoring surveillance. So there is the risk prediction and prevention which you can do by giving 150 milligram of aspirin. Now what do you know about the extended inverted pyramid of care? I have been searching into the literature and interestingly last year this was the article which came out in the Journal of Perinatal Medicine. This is in Serbia and Alexander has shown that the interventions should be focused not only in the preconceptional but should also in the peri-implantation period. I am a hardcore obstetrician, I don't do gynecology, laparoscopy or infertility, to be honest. What I learned about the peri-implantation period is you focus on the quality of the sperm, quality of the ova and also the endometrium. I think the DNA fragmentation of the sperm, it's an advanced technique and uh, the quality of the ova by various biotechnological processes that are available and the quality of the endometrium because it is believed that the dysfunctional placentation is due to dysfunctional endometrium. So the focus is on the peri-implantation period and a lot of gene therapy has been coming to play and also a lot of interventions earlier which are still in the research phase. We all concentrate upon this critical period of fetal development and uh, the real practical scenario still in our country, in the cities, we get a woman with the medical problems at six to nine weeks. That means we currently intervene too late. They still come in the early pregnancies. We all know this embryological development and uh, we always have this in our counseling clinics. What do you mean by preconception care? Suppose you see a clinic of 60 antenatal patient mothers and if you get one mother with a recurrent pregnancy loss, you need to give that time. Probably you cannot give that time in your routine antenatal clinic. So one should decide to have the dedicated counseling clinics on dedicated days. And it means that it refer to the interventions that aim to identify and modify the biochemical, behavioral, and social risk to the women's health or pregnancy outcome through prevention and management. 
So interestingly, there are some CMEs being conducted in the developed countries and it is also included in the curriculums, preconception care, what it is and what it is not. And these are the CMEs that are sponsored which run successfully in the colleges. In the clinical setting, I feel the preconception care is to give protection, to manage the medical conditions and also to avoid exposures known to be teratogenic to the fetus. This is the best way of prevention of the neural tube defects in the, the, and the folic acid supplementations. Immunization against infections, including the checking for rubella in the preconception period and giving immunization with the rubella vaccines and hepatitis B to check in the preconceptional period to check for the couples. Managing conditions, this is what the medical disorders in pregnancy, it has got a huge role. The conditions that are known to be detrimental to the reproductive outcomes, it is diabetes, which is the highest in our country and we are the world capital. Obesity, an excellent talk by the previous speaker, sexually transmitted infections. There was a lady with a, a repeated intrauterine and fetal deaths and she came with pregnancy and when we did the RPR, the VDRL assessment by the rapid reagent assay found to be positive, high titers. She is now at currently 30 weeks and the husband and wife are taking benzathine penicillin. Believe me, still we need to do the RPR assay for our mothers. Diabetes, I don't think I have to emphasize much. The fasting should be 95 postprandial should be less than 120 and strongly advise to avoid conception when she comes with a HbA1c of 10 but after giving the information it's up to her she wants to continue and we need to support her when she wants to continue the pregnancy it's always useful to have the evidence when we counsel these mothers in the preconceptional period and you have this graphic data and tell them that if a hba1c is more than 10 the percentage of congenital anomalies is as high as 30 percent Avoiding exposures, yes, the medications which we commonly come across, the anti-epileptic drugs, the oral anticoagulants, and recently there is an increase in the perinatal mental health problems for these women, and excellent conference is coming out in Nimhans, Bangalore, where you need to have the risk assessment for the women who come to your clinic, and also exposure to tobacco and alcohol. With this little brief introduction of preconceptional counseling, I think I'll go through a few case scenarios where it helps uh, help the couples as well as help us as obstetricians. She's a 27-year-old graduate, she third degree consanguinity, and she had three miscarriages. She came to the pre-pregnancy counseling clinic. Only interesting thing which her mother said is when she was born, she had increased oozing from the umbilical cord stump. And also during the miscarriages, she repeatedly in the second and third miscarriage, she required transfusion of the blood products. So we have referred her to a hematologist and it was told that she already went to a hematologist and all her tests were normal. Because of the third degree consanguinity and also unable to believe that what is the problem with her hematological or coagulation parameters, we referred her to the Nizam Institute of Medical uh, Genetics Department in Hyderabad. We have an excellent medi medical genetics department where this couple has gone through a NGS mode of checking for the uh, coagulation factor abnormalities and she was found to have a defective uh, the mutation in the F13A1 gene which is actually responsible for factor 13 deficiency and both husband and wife have this same factor. The, uh, the genetic screening of the husband is normal but she has got this gene mutation and it is a pathological variant and it has got an autosomal recessive mode of inheritance. And she came back with the pregnancy and during the pregnancy we couldn't do any prenatal diagnostic procedures because she continues to have spotting, bleeding, spotting throughout her all the three trimesters. We have given FFPs but she developed transfusion reaction and then it was converted into cryoprecipitates with the help of the hematologist as well as the geneticist and the obstetrician. She has gone through her pregnancy. We planned an elective cesarean section because of the risk of bleeding is very high. We have given tranaxamic acid one gram IV eight early started prior to the surgery. And on the day of surgery, we transfused cryoprecipitates. And later in the post-operative period, we have given cryoprecipitates. Luckily, she didn't have any problems. She didn't have a postpartum hemorrhage. And the neonate was screened after six weeks. And she has this exon gene mutation, but it is heterogeneous. 
the mother has heterozygous the mother has homozygous mutation which is autosomal recessive but this baby had heterozygous that means no, not much of a risk for her and she will not carry it to her children and she went home with a happy baby coming to the next case this lady interesting this couple went for a health check because they are going to uh, oman and then she found, was found to have a high creatinine and that's how she came to know that she has got a chronic kidney disease stage 3 till then she didn't have any problem she just went for her health checkups so it's always we need to do the baseline blood test we need to counsel the risks of the chronic kidney disease on the fertility and on the pregnancy and similarly as i told you we should have the evidence of these charts where uh, this is in millimoles per liter. If, if you have a creatinine of more than 1.5, it is mild and more than 2.5. And also how much the effect of the pregnancy on the outcome and also on the renal function. So even if they come across a lady with a CKD and pregnancy, even if you terminate, the effect on the kidney is already there and she will lose the kidney function. So there is no point of offering termination for these group of women. The next interesting case is recurrent pregnancy losses, mid-trimester losses, where there is a cervical factor. But in the third, second pregnancy, she was diagnosed to have diabetes. And during the process of delivery, after the baby came out, the placenta was retained, and there was a huge cervical third degree tear, which was sutured, and she came for pre-pregnancy counseling. So in her, apart from the obesity and also hypertension, she's on antihypertensives and uh, metformin. Two issues were there, advanced maternal age more than 35 and advanced paternal age more than 45. So when you chat down the issues and start talking to her, remember advanced paternal age. It's a forgotten father in obstetrics. More than 45 is advanced paternal age and when we do counseling, we need to have this in our mind because these people will have this, particularly men will have a high spontaneous miscarriage and child morbidity because of the disintegration of the sperm integrity. And also, the, they are on the medication, particularly for the male factor infertility, like SSRIs and calcium channel blockers, then there is an effect on the sperm quality. Integration of the men's health apart from, as a part of the preconceptional services is very, very essential. This particular case who came to an emergency room, she's non-pregnant, non-ops, non-gynae, and diagnosed to have a rheumatic heart disease because of her symptoms. So as you all know, most of the pregnant mothers with the heart disease, pregnancy is a window, and they first express their medical problem during the pregnancy. And she was diagnosed to have a severe mitral stenosis and moderate pulmonary arterial hypertension. Despite the medical management, she did not improve, and we need to counsel them to have an interventional procedures prior to planning the pregnancy. And she underwent a balloon mitral volvotomy and she repeated her echo. Then she improved on her status later, became pregnant and came back to us. But risk assessment, my friends, we should remember to know these risk assessment scores, which we have, apart from the NIHA, which we have taught traditionally in our colleges, the CARPREX score, the Zahara score, and WHO, modified WHO risk stratification. This modified WHO risk stratification is freely available in the net. It's uh, ESC guidelines 2018. The beauty of this risk scoring is it tells you whether you can handle that particular woman in your hospital or you have to refer to a higher center. This modified WHO one which we come across very frequently is small unrepaired ASDs and VSDs. The second modified WHO two is repaired ASDs, but these two can be dealt with have, having an in-house physician in our hospital. This is the modified WHO between two and three hypertrophic cardiomyopathies. People do come for counseling pre-pregnancy and they have to be referred to a higher center because 10 to 19 percent is the maternal mortality. Modified WHO 3, the mother who has a rheumatic heart disease, operated, valve repair done, and order anticoagulants. She has both maternal and the fetal risk. And 19 to 27% is the maternal cardiac event rate, like failure or thromboembolism. 
a referral with a cardiac backup is necessary and modified WHO4 where pregnancy is contraindicated. But still we get women with the pulmonary artery hypertension landing up because it's their choice for what they want but we should be very clear the mortality will be as high as 40%. So we need to have with every medical condition an evidence to talk to them, counsel them, give the facts but not to scare them and then stand with them. That is how the preconceptional counseling helps. Finally, avoiding exposure to the teratogenic drugs. Recently, we had this anesthetist who brought his wife. She's on four drugs, four antidepressants, as well as atypical antipsychotics, and want to plan the pregnancy. And he said, we have to support her, and what is that information we have? If you look into the literature, there, this is the international review where it has got five guidelines and, and from 16 countries and give us very clearly majority recommend against switching of antidepressants. Please, please, please don't switch it or don't stop it. In pregnancy, as per the Danish guidelines where peroxetine and fluoxetine are used, we prefer switching and breastfeeding can be done. Only peroxetine has got a risk of congenital heart disease. When you do an echo, you have to be clear which medication the mother is on when you're doing a dedicated fetal echocardiography. And breastfeeding can be done. Postpartum, you can change it onto sertraline or cetilopram. And evidence on risk and benefits of tapering of the drugs is limited. But the Australian and Canadian, they suggest tapering two weeks before the delivery, but others don't. The final to, uh, case was on repeated miscarriages where the products of conception showed a translocation and then the parents karyotype was done and the husband had this translocation and she underwent ICSI twice but all the time the, the she couldn't because the, oh, the eggs were the ova were showing abnormal chromosomes she underwent pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and then successfully delivered a baby. Later she had two miscarriages again and she comes back again with a seven weeks viable fetus last week to a clinic and she requires a prenatal diagnostic procedure. The importance of preconception care has gained all over the world and WHO has a global action plan and this is freely downloadable in the net where the maximizing the gains for the maternal and child health care points are given and also UK has got an excellent guidelines on the preconception advice and management. With this, I would like to end my talk that pre-pregnancy counseling has to be dedicated clinics and it should be offered to all women and encourage vaccinations, review the medical and the physical conditions and offer genetic counseling whenever appropriate. Thank you and I would like to invite you all for this 15th International Normal Labor and Birth Conference in Hyderabad and the theme is Positive Birth and it is on 2nd to 4th of October and Fernandez is privileged to be associated with this conference. Thank you so much. Sorry for exceeding my time. Thank you so much for such an enlightening speech.